If you turn tonight, as we begin our final couple of chapters, chapter 20 here in the book of Revelation. Tonight, that millennial kingdom. I don't know how many of you have ever thought about it, but you know, the world isn't fair, amen? <laughs> you may have not figured that out. It just means you're only two and a half seconds old. But the world's not fair. There's a tremendous amount of inequity in the world, and one of the great promises of Scripture is found in our passage tonight. Because the Lord is going to give equal opportunity for all to enjoy, who love Him, to enjoy the, the earth the way the Lord really intends. We're going to spend a thousand years with our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. And tonight we dig into chapter 20 and this millennial kingdom, this thousand year reign of Christ. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, for the joy of being able to worship you, to sing, to dance a little bit, to clap. Lord, that we have a voice, that everything that has breath should praise the Lord. And we thank you one day that you're coming and you're going to set right all of the wrongs of time. And we pray that you just encourage us and strengthen us tonight. Fill us with your spirit. Lord, have free reign tonight to teach us and instruct us from your holy word. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Verse 1 here in Revelation 20, and then I saw an angel. And I want you to notice something here. It's an angel. It's not God himself. It's not Jesus it is a single, solitary angel. It gives you a sense of the power, the majesty of God's creation and of him himself, that he need not himself go bind Satan. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Hallelujah. Amen? Anybody else been tormented long enough? I think this is one of those days, now I don't know what our view will be like from heaven, but I can tell you this, I'm still selling popcorn to this event too. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'll probably give it away. When that angel goes after Satan himself, grabs him by the throat, and wraps a chain around him, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, the one who from the garden to this night to our day, our time, the one who has tormented mankind since the beginning, the one to whom so many pledge allegiance even now, the deceiver, the liar, the destroyer, the evil one, all of those names, Apollyon, Abaddon, the one who is our foe, He's hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. And I, and I, I love both things about this. Not only is he finally going to be bound and chained, but his lying tongue is going to be stopped. No more perverse words spoken by the enemy of our souls. No one else whispered into their ear ever again. So long as those thousand years are underway. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, he shut him up and he sealed him. So that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years was finished. But after these things, one of the strangest verses in the entire Bible, God lets him go again. And there's a reason for that, and we'll get into it a little bit later. As you look at this passage, so many people believe that this whole passage 
is meant to be taken figuratively. And in fact, if you go to a church that primarily has a reformed view, uh, you may have heard the term ah millennialism, ah meaning no, milne, 1,000, no, 1,000 year. In other words, from the perspective of some today, this is not a literal time. It's a figurative time, and so much so that literally it is being fulfilled in you right now. That because of God's work and salvation, because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that the kingdom has come and it rests within you. And while that is partially true, and it is true to the extent that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the things that are spoken in this chapter have not ever happened. And it says after these things, there will be a thousand year reign of Christ. And there's a very specific piece of information that's given to us. And by the way, if this is as good as it gets, we got gypped. You know, we should die, we should all perish, we should all spend eternity in hell. That is true. That's why it's grace that saves, amen? However, the Lord has greater plans for his kids. Far better than we can imagine. So much so that the Apostle Paul says, I hast not seen nor ear hath heard of the great things that await those who are his beloved. And so the question being, is this a literal return? And I believe it is. And you'll see in this chapter that uh, the literal number 1,000 is spoken of six times in just 15 verses. That means once in every two and a half verses. I do believe the Lord is trying to tell us something very specific about those 1,000 years. He's also using a framework of language so that it can mean no other thing. It literally means 1,000 years. But I believe it is also spoken of in the way that, that we understand the prophetic word of God. And so if you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7, pick up with me there uh, in, in verse 12. Speaking of David, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, it's a nice way of saying, when you croak, David, I will set up your seed after you. When you're done, when your time is up, when you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. In other words, a kingdom that will come out of David's loins. I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. Notice the word forever. And I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of man. But my mercy shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you, and your throne shall be established forever. In other words, at some point in time, someone is going to sit on the throne of David the king. And of course, the one who issues forth from the loins of David, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen? He is of the lineage of David. One of the reasons that the genealogies in Matthew and Luke's gospel are so important, they trace the lineage of Jesus in one sense back through David the king. Interesting archaeological evidence has been unearthed in the last month. It's been debated for a very, very long time whether David was actually a real person. Well, they happen to have just found an inscription on a very large chunk of stone that says, in the time of David, the king of Judah. Every time they turn a spade of dirt in Israel, they find something that says, your Bible is true. God's Son will rule on that literal th throne. And last week, as we saw the Lord return to deal with the armies of mankind, we saw then that the Antichrist, the false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire. So they're already there. And that's where we pick up our study tonight. 
And it begins with this picture of the abyss or bottomless pit. It's a pit that up to this point has, has been empty. And as this chapter unfolds, it begins with just two inhabitants, the Antichrist and the false prophet. And now Satan himself is chained and thrown in. And you'll notice as it speaks of these things, as the, the reign of the Lord on this earth comes to its initial stages, notice that Satan is not omnipotent. The Lord simply sends a single angel after him. So anytime that you think that Satan is God's equal, you are sorely mistaken. Satan is not God's, he's not even an angel's equal. But he is very powerful. And so God says enough. Satan is now bound and he's locked up in this abyss. Satan goes in, has a new guest. As the kingdom age during that time, if anyone gets out of line, because they will have no influence of evil. Remember we saw last time that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, will rule with the rod of iron. In other words, there's going to be a forced righteousness that will occur across the entire globe. Someone gets out of line, I don't know whether it's going to be angels going around going, eh, eh, eh. whether it's going to be the work of the Holy Spirit, which I do believe will be uh, partially the case. But you will not be able to participate in evil. It will be suppressed instantaneously and immediately. And so, all of a sudden, this enemy or adversary is chained. And some people say by the blood of the cross that Satan is bound today. That again is only partially true. And anyone that believes that Satan doesn't have his way with this earth is number one, not a student of scripture, and number two, has never themselves been afflicted by their adversary. And I would say to you that is not what we know to be true on this earth. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, notice what it says. There would be no reason for this warning were the enemy not still doing what we know he does. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, whose adversary? The church's adversary, all believers' adversary, the adversary of every man, woman, and child who's ever named the name of Christ, our adversary, the devil, the same one who's now been grabbed by the neck and thrown into the pit, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Brothers and sisters, that is why Omar Mateen stepped into a nightclub in Orlando. The devil whispered in his ear and he believed the lie of the enemy and he took 49 innocent lives and shot up 52 more. The enemy still roars. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Do you understand what it's saying? In other words, every one of us will experience that same testing. Jesus himself withstood the testing of Satan himself when he was in the wilderness. He wasn't tempted by a demon, he was tempted by Satan himself. And so behind the scenes, working his demonic ways, there is one who pulls the strings of the demonic forces that are in our world today. All evil can be attributed to him. Everything that is against God has its source in the lies of the devil. And finally, the devil is grasped and he's dealt with for a period of a thousand years. But for us, we need to be on guard. We still need to be wise. He's got a very, very, very long leash if he's bound today. Because he seems to be quite effective at affecting not only people, but governments. Not just government, groups of individuals. You see his work all over the world. The division, the hatred, evil. He's behind it all. We need to guard against those things. 
Praise the Lord, he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? Verse John 4, 4. You need to remember that verse. We, we do have a defense. We can resist. We can withstand. And it is true that Hebrews chapter 2 paints a picture of a defeated foe. But that defeated foe has not been fully punished, nor has he been put away yet. He is simply defeated. His end is sure. In that sense, the battle has been won. It does belong to the Lord. But the enemy is very much alive and well on this earth. And for a season, he can strike us. For a season, he can bite us. I read an interesting story according to the doctors, and I've actually witnessed this myself, but the doctors at Good Samaritan Regional Medical Center in Phoenix say, say that many people thought that rattlesnakes could come back from the dead because they would chop their heads off and, and they'd be messing with the head and the head would actually bite them an hour later. Well, number one, that's because you're not too bright and you're playing with the rattlesnake head. Number two, even though the head's off, it still has some ability to reflex and to bite. It has an action that it can undertake. And that old serpent, his head was crushed by Jesus at the cross. And it may be off, and he's on his way to the abyss, but he's still doing this. So you need to be careful. We need to be on guard in that sense. But that day is going to come when God's going to deal with, with the enemy of our souls, with finiteness. And we'll get to verses 7 and 9, and we'll see that he's going to be released for a time. But the beauty of this passage is we have this righteous reward. And, and as we, we think of verse 4, and notice what it says, so important that we realize that, look, we have tremendous hope in what lies ahead as the body of Christ. Yes, the world is a mess. And yes, there are a lot of things, if you don't know the Lord Jesus, they can cause you some sleeplessness. But if you know the Lord Jesus, we know the end of the story, amen? So no matter what happens to you on this earth, to be absent from the body is to be... Amen. So what's the worst thing that can happen? You get run over by a car, you meet Jesus. I'm not suggesting that any of you do that tonight, by the way. Verse 4, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast nor his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now let me square something away for you. This is one of those passages that, that makes me absolutely understand the rapture of the church as an essential doctrine to the, to the church today. Because it's going to get really difficult during that time of tribulation. People say, well, you know, the tribulation's kind of now. You know, we go through all kinds of things. World War II was a type of tribulation. The Holocaust was a type of tribulation. And so tribulation's been happening. We're talking about saints who lose their lives and are immediately beheaded so much so that the the word myriad is used for them that's thousands of thousands now it is true some people have lost their heads for Christ but it's not thousands of thousands every day and so this group this picture that lost their lives for Christ I believe it's painting a picture of the group that we saw back in chapter 6, those tribulation saints who came to faith in Christ, paid the ultimate price, were beheaded for their faith. They refused to deny the Lord Jesus, and they refused to deny the word. Oh, that it would be true of every church in the world that they would not deny Jesus, and they would not deny the word. We need revival in our world, folks. We need to return to the essential doctrines of the faith that says Jesus Christ is Lord and there is no other name under heaven whereby any man may be saved. We need to be preaching Christ crucified alone for the remission of sin. And we need to boldly speak forth the name of Jesus. 
We need to pray in Jesus' name. We need to talk in Jesus' name. We need to live our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. And then when people ask of the hope that lies within us, we point them to God's word. It says, my faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's where we need to be. These people will lose their lives for that testimony. Oh, to be counted worthy. Notice verse 5 and 6, this first resurrection. This is such a confusing topic to so many, and I believe it can be simplified, and hopefully I can do that for you tonight. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished, for this is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for 1,000 years. Again, the focus on that period of time, 1,000 years, and the reigning of those who committed their life to Christ. Right now, those who have died not knowing the Lord are in Sheol. They're in the abode of the dead. They're awaiting judgment. They've been awaiting judgment. Every person who's ever left this planet without faith, without faith specifically now in the age of grace in Christ Jesus, went to that place. Those since the resurrection of Christ have stayed in that place. They remain there tonight. But they have not yet been judged. They're still awaiting that final judgment. And there they stay. We'll deal a little bit more with this when we get to the very end of the chapter. But they will not partake in that first resurrection. There is a second resurrection that waits for them. The resurrection of the unrighteous. As I've said so many times, there are exactly two choices that you can make. They are heaven and hell. They are Jesus Christ and nothing else. They are life and they are death because every last soul will live eternally somewhere. The question is where. The question is not if, it is where. We may wonder about the wind, but that's not the question. The question is where. Where will you spend eternity? If tonight were your last night on this earth, if you went home and died of a massive heart attack, can you say with certainty, I will see my Savior in paradise? If you can, you're on the right side of that first resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22 says this, For as in Adam all die, and even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Amen. Amen. Because there's a universal truth. All y'all are going to croak someday. Or you're going to go straight to be with Jesus when he calls the church home. But the fact of the matter is, you're, you're going to be transformed. For flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But each one in his own order. The first fruits, Christ, and afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Notice there's two different groups of people there. It starts to give us some insight. Who are these resurrected? Who are these ones? Remember what Jesus did when he was crucified and then raised on that third day. From Adam to Christ, all those who perished lived, lived in, a, in a region eternally called Sheol. Two compartments. Luke 16 says this in verse 19. We looked at it on Sunday night a few weeks ago. And there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who had laid at his gate. He sat outside the gated community of the rich man, begging, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. And moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And so it was when the beggar died, the angels carried him away to Abraham's bosom. Now I want you to notice something. Two places, very different conditions, and they can see each other. 
And the rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus his evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, and those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. One in torment, one in comfort, but they're both able to see each other. So where was that place? It's called Sheol, the abode of the dead. First Peter chapter three gives us further insight. Verse 18, quickened by the spirit, he went and preached unto the saints in prison. Where were they imprisoned prior to the resurrection of Christ? Right there with Lazarus, right there with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah. They're all wandering around in a place that Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you shall be with me in paradise. Amen? And yet at that time, they could both see each other. And there's a reason why. Christ had not cried out from the cross yet to tell us, it is finished. It wasn't done. The work hadn't been completed. They believed, they waited by faith. And so when Jesus perished, we covered this, we were in Ephesians 4, he ascended on high and he led captivity captive. And therefore today, because people are cleansed by the blood of Christ, that's why 1 Corinthians 5, 8 tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's no reason to be held any longer because the price has been paid. You can go immediately into the presence of the Lord. And so the Abraham's bosom side of Sheol is empty. The Hades part is still quite full. And they wait. And they wait and they are still waiting. So when Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise, sir, in Luke 23, that was Abraham's bosom that he was talking about. It wasn't yet heaven. He said, I'll see you there, and then we're exiting stage left. Jesus himself said in John 5, verse 28, Do not be amazed at these things, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear the voice and come out, and those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. In other words, there's two resurrections. There's one that is that resurrection unto life, eternal life, and a second, which is a resurrection unto damnation. And so you really want to be part of the first one. Just saying. It comes, I believe, it's easy to see in four phases. The first one, when Christ and some of the Old Testament saints were waiting, Jesus took them away. They got to go to heaven. The next one is going to be us if we're still around when the Lord comes for his church. Amen? And we're going to meet him in the air. Remember, that's not here, that's there. The rapture. The third part, remember two guys who get some personal treatment? I believe it's likely Moses and Elijah. The two witnesses, they also get resurrected. They're part of that first resurrection. And then finally our passage tonight, those tribulation saints who went through the tribulation and said, you know what, I'm not denying Jesus and I will not deny the word of God. And they will be raised. And so four parts of the first resurrection. Now we have the craziest passage we find in the Bible. Satan is released again. Notice what it says in verse seven. And now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be re released from his prison. In other words, he's in the bottomless pit. He's there with, with the antichrist and the false prophet. And for some 
reason that seems to be unknown to us, but it really isn't, and we'll look at it. He's going to go out and deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together in battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Now remember, there's been a thousand years. Idyllic condition. No sin. So there won't be any bizarre things like we have in our world. People will know each other, love each other, and they're going to live for a thousand years. There are going to be a whole bunch of babies. The earth is going to get repopulated again, in essence. After all of the things that have gone on during the tribulation, two-thirds of the world population in total will be wiped out, but there's still going to be plenty of people left, and they will live for a thousand years without the influence of sin. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. The beloved city is another name for the city of Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. In other words, Satan is going to have one last go at mankind as soon as he rele he's released. If you want to ever understand the, the heart of Satan, this is it. You would think after a thousand years being locked up with the entire world, absolutely under a righteous reign of Jesus himself from the throne of David. Perfect conditions have, have returned. Nobody's having wars. Nothing's going on that's the things that we know today is our normal day-to-day -day living. There are no terrorist attacks anywhere in the world. Righteousness reigns on the earth. And all of a sudden, here comes Satan again. That was an interesting group of people that will be alive at this time. There will be people who were on the earth when Jesus returns who have not yet received their resurrection bodies. And they are going to live all the way through the millennial reign of Christ. And they will have children. And so guess what? They're still going to have free will. The only thing is they're not going to be able to exercise that free will. They will be under the reign of Christ and thereby they will live righteous lives whether they want to or not. And so because everyone must make a choice to either accept or reject. You see, the only way for love to have any meaning at all, and God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, amen? He didn't just pressure us into a decision that seems to be correct. He gave us the option of not choosing to love the Lord. And so Satan is released for one more go-around at all those who were on the earth who up to this point really have had no option to exercise their choice. They've lived in righteousness. And the crazy thing is, our passage tells us people are going to still follow Satan. You don't think the heart of man is wicked? You don't think that we aren't deceitful and above all things wicked in our intent of our heart? After a thousand years of righteousness, people are still going to choose to follow Satan. That's that seed of Adam. And before you're too harsh on those that would be alive, and they, you would fare in a very, very different manner were it not for grace. Imagine that it will cost you your life to serve the Lord. Imagine it will cost you your life to own a Bible, much like our our missions trip that's, that's in planning stages, once we turn those Bibles over in China, we're okay going in, but the person who receives them, that can cost you your life for transmitting Bibles through China. You see, we, we don't get that. Here, it's like, well, I can go to the bookstore and buy some. You get caught out on the street, you're driving home, and you've got a stack of Bibles in your car. The only thing that's going to happen to you is people are probably going to ask you why you have so many Bibles. But you're not going to jail for it. You certainly won't lose your life. You see, God wants us to be in love with him. He doesn't want us to just do what was the accusation against Job by Satan himself. Remember what that accusation was? Well, if you just take away all the good things that you do to him, he's going to curse you to your face. You see, Satan being a liar, he's going to use that one more time. And all those who have lived righteously on this earth 
will have to be released, notice it says, for a little while. He's just going to go out for a short period of time. Matter of fact, I, I, we are not told how long it is, but I don't think it's going to be long. Because God's not going to give Satan a chance to get rolling again. And then we'll come against Jerusalem one more time. And it says Gog and Magog, and sometimes people say, well, you know, this must be the same war of Ezekiel 38 and 39, and it hasn't ended yet, and they get totally confused. But let me help you with it. Most of you know of Napoleon Bonaparte. Most of you understand that he fought a battle uh, that uh, was the Battle of Waterloo in Belgium, and he lost that battle. Amen? He got defeated. First time in his military career, he was actually defeated. And so we have a saying, when someone loses a battle that they should have won, and it's decisive, we say they met their Waterloo. I believe it's the same situation here. I believe God is just simply making a point that the spirit that enraged Gog and Magog, Russia and her allies, Persia, the North African nations that are predominantly Muslim, that will come against God, that will come against Christ himself, will come against the Lord. They will battle in the valley of Escadrillion as they're there in Megiddo. And they finally come to the valley of Jehoshaphat as they're around Jerusalem, as they surround and the Lord defeats them. There will still be a little bit of that spirit left in the world. Because some of those people will be forced to live righteously but inside, and I can tell you, there's people in the church that are just like that. Maybe they married into a Christian family. Maybe uh, they pretend. We see it very often, and sometimes, you know, we can spot the, the one guy or the one gal who's come to church. They think, well, this is a good place to find a spouse. And they're being right. They speak really good Christianese as long as they're at church. Then you drive by one of these clubs over here and you see their car parked outside. You go, hmm, maybe that's not real. You see, during that time, they'll be forced to be righteous. But they will not have made a decision to follow Christ. And so Satan is released one last time. Isaiah chapter 2 says this in verse 2. And now it shall come to pass, speaking of those very last days, the beloved city, that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains. And, and if you travel to Jerusalem today, you'll, you'll know that the, the Lord's city is really not on the tops of the mountains. It's not on top of Mount Scopus. It's not on the top of the Mount of Olives. Those are predominantly Arab settlements. A little bit of Mount Scopus. But the mountains around Jerusalem are, are not really, they don't belong to the Lord today. Matter of fact, the Temple Mount doesn't belong to the Lord today. It's inhabited by mostly three mosques. And shall be exalted above the hills, and the nations shall flow into it, and many people shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountains of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people, and shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn of war anymore. Can I tell you that hasn't happened yet in the history of the nation Israel? The nation Israel is the, the city of Jerusalem, may be the most contested place on the planet. And yet, it will not be a place of war. If you travel today, uh, you're, you're going to be seeing the slides here in the next weeks as we put together some slides from our recent Israel trip. You're going to see something that you're probably not prepared to see, and that's exactly how contested it is. They're building currently an underground wall around the Gaza Strip, 47 miles long, in some places over 100 feet below the surface of the earth to stop all these terrorist tunnels they keep digging. It's a hotbed. Probably most of you haven't, well, we had fireworks last night, but I haven't had any missiles launched at my house. <laughs> a nearly daily occurrence in Israel. 
Because darkness doesn't, darkness hates the light. There'll be light and the darkness is going to get one last shot. How foolish is the man who rejects the Lord. Family of God, hell's a real place. <coughs> hell is a real place. People don't like to talk, I don't like to talk about hell. I'm a pastor and I don't like talking about hell. It gives me a little bit of an uneasy feeling in my stomach. Why? Because I know it's real and I know the moment the word comes out, many people go, ah, oh, there they go again. And they turn off their ears. They turn the sound down. Hell is real. And the devil, verse 10 says, says, who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. So now the unholy trinity are all where they belong. Amen? And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever and ever. And hallelujah, church. Can't wait. May it be next week. The reason I said that is a lot of people that need Jesus. For all those who believe in the annihilation of the wicked. And what I mean by that is that when you die, you simply cease to exist. And that is a vast majority of humankind. Many people believe that when you die, yeah, you just go back, you're worm food. It's just over, it's done, you're gone. Your Bible says otherwise. For a thousand years, the Antichrist, the false prophet, had been cast into the lake of fire. Now Satan is sent there to join them. Now, so, can I just tell you that musically, nothing good happened in the 1980s? <laughs> we birthed disco, of all things. And back in the 1980s, Alice Cooper had an album called Alice Cooper Goes to Hell. And the whole context of that album was it was like this total raucous party scene and everybody who was against God just went there and they all, you know, they toked and smoked and drank and did whatever and it was just like this amazing, you know, eternal party. Can I tell you that's not what your Bible says? Hell is a very, very real place. Matter of fact, in Mark chapter 9, Jesus himself speaking about it, he said there where their worm does not die. And the word worm there is actually more easily and better translated maggot. Where their maggot doesn't die and their fire is not quenched. Jesus speaking about hell. In other words, you'll be very much alive. You'll be eaten by maggots and you'll be burned for eternity. Not, now, that's Jesus. We, we love to talk about the love of God, amen? We do, I, I do. I love to talk about the love of God and the mercy of God and the blessings of God and the glory of God and God's kindness and His goodness and His absolute blessings that He pours out upon us. But can I tell you this? There is an option to choosing that. And the option ultimately carried out to its finiteness is what's coming next in our passage tonight, the great white throne judgment. You, you see, you can either choose heaven or you can choose hell. Hell to me is shocking. It's, it's gross. It's, I think about it, it's like I can't imagine that anyone would choose that. But the problem is Satan deceives so much, he says, oh, it's not real. I believe that is his number one tactic to keep people lost. Hell's not real. There's no such thing as hell. Well, if you believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, Jesus said hell. He spoke more about hell than anybody else in all of Scripture. And he did that because he doesn't want anybody to go there. Now notice in verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. Remember, there's a second resurrection. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. Peter reminds us of this time, but of the day of the Lord, it will come as a thief in the night. 
Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10, which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, the elements will melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. In other words, the earth as we know it is not just going to get a makeover, it's going to get a redo. You see, we talk about refurbishing things. We, we talk about doing an extreme makeover. What this earth needs is not an extreme makeover. It needs to be remade. And the Lord will actually do that. And it says that there will be a, a, a great white throne and him who sat on it will judge the nations. I remember Jesus in John chapter 5 said, the Father judges no one, but has committed the judgment to the Son. You know why that is? Because it is to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that, that allows you to be saved. So all judgment is in Jesus the Son. God the Father said, look, this is how it is. Christ, Jesus, is the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. And so all judgment is in the hands of Jesus the Son. It's what do you do with Jesus? You see, that's that great white throne judgment. Everyone who has ever rejected Jesus. Now, that whole compartment that is still full of unrighteous dead people right now that have been waiting. The other side's been emptied where Lazarus used to hang out with Abraham. Stone cold empty. Nobody there. They've been looking across that gulf now for 2,000 years going, where'd everybody go? Jesus set the captives free. He says, time to go. You waited in faith long enough. Come on home. But they're still waiting. And I wonder sometimes if they're not waiting, well, maybe somebody will show up. Maybe somebody will take up the other side. But they're waiting in vain. And notice verse 12, and I saw the dead as these books are opened. And there are two of them, at least, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. You see, when you, when you get down to this place, when you get to the great white throne judgment, you're, you're not going to be able to wave some kind of, you know, hey, I paid extra taxes so I don't have to go through this card. But don't you know who I am card? You're not going to be able to, well, I was really rich and famous. It is not going to matter. When you take your last breath and you're standing before the judgment seat of God where he will finally judge all the unrighteous dead. The only question that will have put you there is what did you do with the Lord Jesus Christ? And the books were open and another book was open which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Now you know why it's so important that your name be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, the death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged according everyone to their own works. And then death and Hades, death itself, and Sheol itself, the abode of the dead, it's been a place where all these people throughout all these centuries have rested going, well, one day, maybe we're going to get out of here. All of a sudden, their hope is gone. We're cast into the lake of fire, into Gehenna, that place that burns with smoke. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Look, it's important to know that Jesus promised he'd never blot your name out of the book of life if you're his. So you don't have to worry about it. If your name's in it, you're good. But if your name's not written in the Lamb's book of life, you got a problem. You see, the book of life, a person, it's a list of every person who's ever born. Everyone who's ever lived is in there. The Lamb's book of life is a list of all those who were born twice. Remember, you must be born again. Amen. You need that second birth, and you need that second book. 
You see, for those who love the Lord, your name's in the book of life, your name is also in the Lamb's book of life. As the Lord said, look, it's possible to have your name blotted out. By the way, that doesn't just come from the, from the New Testament, it comes from the Old Testament. From Exodus chapter 32. God actually, actually told Moses, say, look, you need to tell him. If you don't believe me, I'll blot your name out. Revelation chapter 3, verse 4 says this, and yet few people in Sardis, speaking of the church at Sardis, who have not soiled their clothes, they will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. And he who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white, and I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and the angels. Look, man, Jesus is going to call roll. You see, you can have two births. You'll be in two books. If you have one birth, one book, and from that book you will actually be erased. You don't want Jesus erasing your name because you never believed in him. So you got the choice. But if you don't want to be in his book, he won't make you be in his book. He'll let you say, no, please take my name out. You see, because God desires that all men be saved. Everyone come to the knowledge of repentance. The opportunity is there for every last person who's ever lived. So the choice is yours. You can be born twice, be in two books. You can be born once, and you'll have your name blotted out. Because you don't love him. You see, one day the Lord's going to call roll. Just exactly as Jesus promised. For whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, I will confess him before my Father which is in heaven. That's roll call, amen? Yeah. He's like, present. You remember you used to have to do that in school? Jeff Gill, here. Man, can you imagine what it's going to be like when Jesus calls your name? Oh, happy day, amen? <laughs> here. He'd be up, jumping up and down. I'm over here. Thank you, Jesus, for not blotting my name out. Thank you for writing my name in the book, Lamb's Book of Life. That old hymn, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the save of the earth shall gather over on the other shore, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder. Can't you imagine that? Can you imagine that? When Jesus is going through, it's like, there's Jeff, and oh, there's Greg, and it's like, oh, right here, there's Cliff, and there's Steph, and Connie, oh, man. It's like, am I, yep, you're in there, come on in. How great will it be to hear your name called in the roll of heaven? Man, can't wait. And here's the crazy thing. To as many as call upon the Lord, call upon the name of the Lord, and you'll be saved. It's that simple. I'm going to bring the worship team back up, Cliff and the band, if they'd come up. You see, if your name's in there, if it's in the book of life, it's in the Lamb's book of life when roll is called. What Jesus said in John 16 is this, because of sin, they do not believe in me. And the verses that we often forget that surround John 3.16, verse 18, is very, very important to John 3.16. So is 17, but 18, for he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. In other words, by our choice, we've said, God, blot my name out of the book of life, and I don't want you to even write my name in the Lamb's book of life. I don't want to be in any of your books, God. Take my name out. That's not what the Lord wants for his kids. Imagine having your life replayed and get down to that place to where you knew that there was a decision to make and choosing to not love the Lord. 
and then getting to the great white throne and standing before God as everything you've ever done is revealed. The books are open. There it is. Your life in technicolor. Man, even as a child of God, I'm not sure I want anybody to see my life. But I can tell you I don't want anybody to get to that place to where Jesus says, Depart, for I have never known you. Oh, God, may that not be true of anyone. You see that great holding tank for all those who don't know the Lord one day is going to get emptied. And Jesus, as he spoke the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 25, 41, and then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. Notice who it was prepared for, the devil and his angels. It was never prepared for a single human being. God's never desired, that's why he hates the death of the wicked. That's why he hates the death of the wicked. And family of God, we gotta preach the truth. We gotta stop dancing around the gospel. There is a real hell and people can go there if they choose. But there is a real savior who will bring you into his eternal kingdom if you'll simply ask. You can take the complete pardon or you can try and convince God at the great white throne and it's not going to work. For by the works of the flesh is no one justified. I'm going to ask you to stand. And I would be totally remiss. I'm going to ask actually the pastors if they'd come forward right now, please. It's not time to be playing around. It's time to get real with Jesus. And so I'm going to ask a very, very, very simple question. Do you know him? Because if you do, your name's in the Lamb's book of life. And he's going to leave your name in the book of life. And you're going to spend eternity with Jesus. But if you don't know him, and your name's not in the Lamb's book of life, then you're flirting with this being true. You're willing to stake your eternity on a decision that there is no God and there is no hell. That's not a wise choice. You can make it. And so I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If there's anyone here and you've never received Christ as your Savior, I'm simply going to ask you to slip your hand up in the air wherever you are in the sanctuary. If you don't know Jesus tonight, you want to know Jesus right now. You don't want to go home wondering about where you're going to spend eternity. Maybe you've been walking away from the Lord and you're not sure that you actually ever knew Jesus. Maybe that's you tonight. Same thing, just put your hand up in the air. I want to pray with you, pray for you. Okay. Father, we pray that as the word has gone forth into our hearts, that you would take and fill us now with your spirit. And Lord, by their admission, everyone in this room knows you. Lord, we pray that we'd walk with you, that our lives would count. Lord, that we might be able to be put to death for the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the word of God. That there'd be enough evidence to convict us. We pray that you'd bless us and fill us with your spirit, that you'd use us for your glorious purposes, that you would grow your church into a vibrant church. Lord, a church that cares about the lost. We thank you, Father, for all that you've done. Thank you, Jesus, that you took upon yourself the form of a man and came to this earth 
and you weren't ashamed to die, even the death of the cross. We bless your holy name for that. We bless the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.